Hey guys, it's Courtney, and today I'm going to be creating a very simple one layer scene with the Sunday Afternoon Stamp Set by Simon Says Stamp. I am going to start off by stamping out some of my images that I'm going to be using on my card onto some Simon Says Stamp masking paper. I'm using my Misty for this just to make it a little bit easier, but you don't necessarily need to have a perfectly stamped image on your masking paper. Just kind of picking out some images that are a little bit different in size just to give a little bit of perspective on my card and throwing in that little strawberry and cherry just as kind of just a little bit something else <laughs> other than the main images, I guess. So I'm gonna go ahead and stamp those out and I will fussy cut these out. I am gonna be doing a little bit of ink blending on the card, so I wanna make sure that my masks are cut to the best of my ability. Next, I'm gonna take a panel of Nina Solar White 80 pound cardstock. This is an A2 size. And I'm gonna start off with what used to be my T-square ruler until I broke it and a pencil. And I'm just drawing out my lines for my tabletop or countertop, whatever you want to consider this. And I'm gonna be doing a little bit of perspective here. So I'm gonna start with my horizontal lines and I'm putting them a little bit closer together the further back they get. Now I'm gonna draw or just put a dot. Well, first I, I messed up. <laughs> Told you guys I'm a little rusty. I've been away from it for a couple of months, so I am a little rusty. So I made a few mistakes here and there, but I'll link a video below on perspective um, and a very simple way to get perspective on your cards. Um, I should have taken my own advice because I messed this up and I put my, my focal point or vanishing point, they call it, in the middle of the table instead of what should have been in the middle of the card. Then I ended up putting it on the top of the card, which worked out okay had I measured correctly, but I didn't, it is what it is. Once it's all colored and all put together, hopefully nobody will notice and if they do, it's handmade, nothing is supposed to be perfect. But basically I am going to measure a, I think it was a half an inch on the bottom and kind of just making little tick marks there or using my work surface. And I am going to make each one of those points match up with the vanishing point on the top of the card. So that way it gives perspective and once everything is put together, stamped out and colored, it will look as if the table goes back, just like a table would or a countertop, whatever you wanna call it. And I wanna make this checkered. So I am going to kind of make some crisscrosses here and then color them in black and white later on. So once I am happy with all of my lines or as happy as I'm gonna be, because it is what it is, I am going to go ahead and stamp my images. Now I always do this in my pencil first because obviously I make a ton of mistakes and I can just erase them. So I'm gonna stamp directly over my pencil lines before I make any of these permanent. So I'm gonna put this into my Misty and line up the images the way I want them with my masks first. Even though I cleaned my stamps, I wanna make sure that there's no leftover residue of ink on them and I don't get any smudges on my paper. So I'm gonna use my masks just to kind of lay things out. Obviously, I want this bigger Sunday here to be towards the front because that would appear bigger to us and the smaller one in the back and kind of the middle one or medium sized one kind of in between that. I'll lay down my little strawberry and cherry as well and go ahead and stamp those. I am stamping with Blackout Ink by Ink on 3 because it is a Copic Safe ink. It is my favorite Copic Safe ink. And I did end up stamping these images twice just to get a bold black image. Not necessary, it's just what I prefer. So once those are stamped out, I'm going to mask those first. You don't have to at this point. You can draw your lines in and make them permanent before masking, but I just find it easier that if I happen to go over the image at all, my mask is going to protect it. So I'm gonna bring back out my ruler and a Copic Safe pen. I am using an EK Success journaling pen, which they no longer make, but I will link something very similar below. It's by Ranger. Um, they have different sizes in the packaging and it's very similar to the EK Success. 
So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw directly over my pencil lines, at least the pencil lines that I wanna make permanent, <laughs> not my mistake pencil lines. And then I am going to take a piece of post-it note tape just to block off the bottom portion of my card where the table or countertop would be because I am going to do a little bit of ink blending on the top, I guess it would be the wall maybe. And this will just protect the bottom portion of my card. I'm gonna be using three different colors, sponge sugar, worn lipstick, and picked raspberry, and a Trinity stamp blending brush here. And I'm just gonna lay out a little bit of my color first. I'm not worried about blending it the first time around. I'm gonna go from lightest to darkest. My darkest will be um, coming out from behind the table, which that would naturally be darker anyway. And then once I get my colors down, that's when I will actually worry about them blending. So you can see that I'm adding a lot more ink here and I'm gonna kind of go back and forth to make sure that my colors blend. I use the same brush. I know a lot of people have a different brush for every single color or every single color family. I don't. I wash my brushes, I reuse them, I kind of wipe them off on scrap piece of paper or a paper towel or whatever, and I can keep going. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a ton of brushes. I don't feel the need to have a ton of brushes. Um, this works just fine for me. So once I am happy with my blending, I can go ahead and remove my post-it note tape and take my advice here, let the Distress Oxide, especially if you use Distress Oxide, they tend to stay wet a little bit longer than most inks. Let it dry for a minute or two before removing the rest of your masks because the masks are also paper. And when you try to remove them against wet ink, they tend to tear which is fine, but sometimes it tears your paper along with it. And that is exactly what happened with me. I typically use the tip of my scissors just to kind of get my masks started. And as I peeled this first one up, you'll see that it did rip a little bit of my paper. I'm not worried about it. I can fix that later. But in order to avoid any more <laughs> of this happening, I am going to let that dry for a minute or two before removing the rest of my masks. So next I can go ahead and begin my coloring and I'm gonna start off with my tabletop. But first I'm gonna erase my pencil lines. The pencil lines that kind of were shining through or showing through, you wanna make sure that you erase those first before you start your coloring. Once you color over them, you will not be able to erase them. So now on to the coloring. I am going to start with a C1 and I am just going to color in the tiles or the squares that will be black. I'm laying out my shadows first. I lied. I'm just going to kind of lay out my shadows for each one of these items just so I don't lose them. I guess this wasn't necessary because I'm going to go ahead and add them later on anyway, but I am going to color in each one of my squares that is going to be black just so that I don't lose track. I don't want to get halfway through my coloring and realize that I didn't space it right <laughs> and there's really no covering that up. So now that I know which squares are going to be white, which squares are going to be black, I can begin my coloring. Now like I said, when you're looking at one single object like this table or like this countertop, the further back it gets, the darker it's going to appear. If you just Google images of tables or any scene, beach scene, desert scene, fields, anything, you'll notice that the further back it goes, the darker it's going to get. So for my white squares here towards the back, I'm going to do a little bit of shading with a C5, which is a pretty dark gray when you want something to appear white. And it is going to look pretty dark in the beginning. But once all of your coloring is complete, they will look like white squares. For the second row here, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to add a little bit less. So you'll see that the back row here, I'm finishing off with a C1 and I'm adding a little bit more of the lighter colors to the second row. And as I move towards the front, you'll notice that I use less or none at all of the darker colors and more of the lighter colors. I'm gonna go on to some of the black squares and you'll see that I am starting right off with my black marker and shading the very back portion of each one of these tiles. I'm not leaving a whole lot of room. I'm going about halfway down with the black. And for the second row, you'll notice that I'm not adding quite as much. I'm going about a third of the way this time just to make it a little bit lighter as it, gets, as it moves towards us. 
Now I'm gonna shade these with, or extend these out, I should say, with a C7, which is a super dark gray. It's not too far off from black. So I am going to extend those out because like I said, the further back it gets, the darker it's going to appear. And then I will finish off with a C5, which is still significantly dark, but it will be my highlight color, I should say, for the second row. I'm going to totally skip that for the back row because I want those to be the very darkest ones there are. So you can see that I'm not leaving a whole lot of space for my C5. I'm just extending that C7 out pretty far so that it isn't too dark or so that it isn't too light, I should say. And then as I move towards us, I'm going to use less and less. I'm not going to show you this whole thing because I think you kind of get it by now. So I made my way all the way down to the front of the table with the black squares, I guess I could say, um, but they get lighter as they come towards us. And now I'm going to go in with the white squares. I'm going to add a little bit of shading, less and less as I get towards us, very similar to what I did with the black squares, except for these are going to be obviously significantly lighter. Now, this is where I can tell that I did not space my squares out very good. And it was the horizontal squares, not necessarily the vertical ones, um, the ones I never measured for. I need to get myself another T-square ruler because I use that thing. If you guys have been subscribed to me for a while or have watched my videos before, you know that that is like my main tool that I use. <laughs> and when I just have a straight edge, it makes it a little bit more difficult for me, but it is what it is. So now that the uh, floor, or not floor, I get counter, table is done, I can move on to the shadows. I'm just going to go in with the C7. C7 is a lot darker than I typically go in with the shadow, but I need to make sure that it's going to cover up those black squares or that you can at least see the shadows underneath those black squares. So I'm just going to kind of outline that very bottom of each one of the images and just extend that off to the sides just a little bit, then go in with my C5 and extend that area out, and then my C3. Now you're not going to see the C3 over the black squares and that's fine you'll get the idea that there is a shadow there so moving on to the coloring of the images themselves now where this ripped my paper a little bit I am going to go in with my Copic Safe Pen just to draw back in my lines that I lost of the image itself. And I'm just going to follow it. It doesn't have to be perfect because if you can't tell, neither can the recipient. So I kind of just drew in my lines to the best I, the best I could. So we're going to start off with some BG markers for the, um, I don't know what you'd call these. They're not bowls, but they're like the Sunday containers. <laughs> I'm sure there's a name for them, but I'm going to go in with my BG10, which is pretty light, and I'm just going to add a little bit of shadowing. At this point, I'm not sure how much I'm going to want or need. I'm just going to go in sparingly. I can always add more later. So I'm going to go in with the BG13, add a little bit of those darker areas, blend that out a little bit with that BG10 again, then I'm going to bring in my C00. Because I don't want this to be completely white, I want it to have, the blue greens are basically the just the shadows, but it is kind of supposed to be glass. So I want it to make it kind of sort of look like glass. So I'm going to blend these out with the C00. And I picked up the one that was completely dried up and had to refill that. So once I kind of blended it out it's hard to tell you have to let it dry so even though alcohol ink dries very very quickly you'll be able to tell if the paper is saturated and you're not going to get a true idea of what it's going to look like until it's completely dry so i moved on to the next one did a little bit of shading pretty much the same way as i did the first while that first one was drying then i can get an idea of what it actually looks like now rather than when it's wet because the colors will continue to blend they will continue to bleed even after you're done coloring it doesn't take too long for it to happen but it will continue to bleed and you can tell just by doing the second one the color of the paper is kind of like a more gray than it will be once it dries so I'm going to go back into that first one just because I felt like it wasn't really blended that well and it didn't really have enough shading to it. I'm just going to add a little bit more of that BG13, a little bit more of that BG10, and then do the same thing with that C00 and just blend those areas out. 
I did the same thing with the third one as well. Really no rhyme or reason as far as where I put my shadows. Just wanted a little bit of color. Now for this first Sunday, I want this to look like it is vanilla ice cream. So I'm just going to add a little tiny bit of shading with a W1, warm gray one. Very little shading here. And I don't have anything warm gray lighter than that. So it's hard to kind of blend that out to white when I don't have anything lighter. So I'm just going to use that C00 again. I'm pretty much using it as a colorless blender. I do own a colorless blender, but it is quickly drying up and I could have sworn I had a refill for it, but I do not. So for the toppings of the ice cream here, I'm going to do chocolate for the topping here and it's kind of dripping off the side. You can also make this the ice cream dripping off the side, however you want to color this. There's so many different options when it comes to these images. So I'm just going to add a little bit of the darker color towards the bottom, blend that out with the mid-tone and finish off with the lightest towards the top. Now, if you've ever seen one of my coloring videos, you will notice that I typically go in with my lightest color first and then go in with my darkest color. These areas of these images are so tiny that I want to avoid bleeding, if at all possible. And by going in directly with my darkest color first, I may be able to avoid that because I'm not oversaturating the paper. Now for the stem and the leaves of the strawberry, I'm just going to go in with three different colors here and I'm pretty much just outlining the leaves because they fall one over the other. Have you guys ever done that where you try to put the cap on your marker and the tip of the marker slides down your hand and you get ink all over the place? I do it all the time. I, I swear, I don't understand how my skin is not permanently stained from all of the things that I've done in my craft room. So I did all of the stems and leaves here and then I'm going to save the reds for last. I always save my reds for last because they are the hardest color to fix. So if I do have any bleeding, I can fix it a little bit easier rather than having to color over it. So for the strawberries, again, I'm going to go directly in with my darkest color first. You'll see that I left a little sliver of white on the top portion of that strawberry and I'm going to fill that in with my lightest color just to add a little bit of highlight. I'm going to pretty much use the same technique for the straw. The straw is round, so I'm going to add shading to either side to make it look round and it really wasn't dark enough for me. I like a lot of contrast. So I ended up going in with that scary dark red just a tiny bit. You'll see that my markers are straight up and down so that I can get into those tiny areas. I also added a little bit of shading to the white area of the straw, which I should have done first. I just had to be super careful that I didn't accidentally touch my tip of the marker on that red because I would have dragged that color in places I didn't want it to be. So for my second one here, I'm going to make chocolate ice cream. So I'm not going to make it. I'm going to color it. But I'm going to use the same colors as I did for the first one. And you'll see that there's three scoops that we can see here. And they're like overlapping. So I'm going to use that technique where I leave a little bit of a white edge around the edges of the middle scoop. And that's going to add a little bit of a highlight, but it's also not going to interfere with the shadow that I created on the scoops on either side. So it's still going to look like three scoops because I'm using such a dark color. You're really not going to be able to see the black outline of the image to know. So I have to depend on my shading. But I'm going to do that the same way as I did the first one with the chocolate. For the whipped cream, I'm just going to add a little bit of shading with that W1 again, just from the bottom up. You can kind of add some texture to this if you want. I just kept it very, very simple and again, blended that out with the C00 or you can use a colorless blender for that as well. Going to bring back out my C markers for the two straws that are hanging out of this one. Just adding a little bit of shading on either side again because these are round objects. I want to make sure that I keep a pretty strong center highlight. These areas are tiny. You can get away with just using two colors on this. Now I wanted to bring back some of that um, BG color. So I brought in that BG 15 or 13. Did I use 15? I think 13. And I just added just a little bit of color to those sprinkles on this one. Well, I lied. First, I colored the <laughs> cherry. And I'm using the same color combination as I do for the strawberry. Again, just kind of keeping a center highlight because it is a round object. You'll also notice here that I didn't bother to cut out the mask for the stem of the cherry. 
way too tiny and I can color directly over whatever's in the background with a dark brown. I wasn't even gonna attempt that. So now I'm gonna add the color to the sprinkles with that BG13 and then we will move on to this third sundae here. For this ice cream, I'm gonna make this vanilla again, but I'm gonna make it a little bit different color. I'm gonna use my C markers, and you can see that I'm adding just a tiny bit of that C5 for the very deepest areas because there's a lot overlapping the ice cream in this. So I want to make sure that I add a bit, pretty strong shadow, but keep most of it still being white. Now for the, um, what I thought were jelly beans, and when I first looked at this, I'm like, why did they put jelly beans on an ice cream sundae? But I'm thinking now that they're probably peanuts. So I'm going to color them as if they are nuts. And these things sticking out the bottom, I'm also going to, I'm assuming they might be almonds. So that's the way I'm going to color them. I'm only going to use three colors here. I didn't want to go with too much contrast just because I didn't want it to appear as if it was chocolate. I wanted to keep it a little bit different than the chocolate areas. So for the uh, topping on this one, I'm going to make this strawberry. And this, the only where, place you see this really is dripping off the side. So I'm gonna go right in with that darkest color once again, using it pretty sparingly on just the areas that are kind of dripped down. And then I will blend that out with a R85, which I probably could have skipped because it is so similar to the darkest color that I probably could have skipped one or the other. And then the R83 and R81. Went ahead and colored the strawberries and cherries just like I did with the first one. And then I am going to fix my mistakes. So anywhere where I had any bleeding or anywhere that I went out of the lines because I am rusty. I do not have it anymore, <laughs> but I will get there. But I'm fixing those areas with a white gel pen just to be just being very careful that it's not too noticeable. I'm just going in very lightly. But then I'm also going to add a few highlights to some of the darkest areas of the different images within the images, just to add a little bit of, I don't know, highlight, I guess. <laughs> Finally, I am going to finish off with the sentiment. And I usually use an acrylic block for my sentiment, but I did put it on the acrylic block crooked. And I thought it was just me like, oh, I can't even stamp anymore. But it was just a little crooked. So I'm just going to lift up the corner here and let it fall into place as it wants to. It will naturally be straight. And then I can stamp that down. I'm stamping that with VersaFine Onyx Black Ink and then finishing off with a little bit of shimmer with a wink of Stella. But that is it. That is the card for today. As always, I will leave the supplies listed in the description box below. Thanks so much for stopping by and have a great day. Bye.